Hi, I'm Phil Lockwood. Welcome to this introduction to the Rotax 912 series of aircraft engines. Working with the 9 series since 1989 has given me a deep appreciation for their capabilities and reliability. We'll cover some of the most unique characteristics of these engines, their maintenance and operations. These helpful tips have been gained from years of operational and maintenance experience and the questions that you most commonly ask. Typically, the difference between those who experience trouble-free operation and those who don't is in the way their engines are set up and maintained. Once you've gained a fundamental understanding of the operational and maintenance requirements of these engines, you've opened the door to a lifetime of trouble-free operation. Each of the 9 series Rotax aircraft engines is offered in two versions. Now there's a lot of confusion over this, but really it's pretty simple. Either you can buy the FAR 33 certified engine, or you can buy the UL version, which is ASTM compliant. Now most light sport aircraft today use the ASTM compliant. Let's go over some of the key components on this 912 ULS installation. Up front we have the gearbox which reduces the uh, engine RPM for the propeller. The mechanical fuel pump is actually driven off the gearbox. Today we'd like to give you some information to help you avoid some of the common problems that we see in our engine shop. Now most of the problems that we have to take care of are easily avoidable if you use the correct maintenance techniques. Now Dean uh, mans our technical support line most of the time and uh, I'm sure, Dean, you see a, 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 lot, a lot of, of uh, a lot of questions. And uh, so what are some of the common questions that you're, you're getting right now? I'm going to start with this one. What oil should I be using in my Rotax engine? Basically, there are three types of oil that you can use. You can use a, a, a full synthetic, a semi-synthetic, or a regular mineral-based oil. We call that dinosaur oil. Uh, now, we don't want to use aviation oil, which is what you would use in a Lycoming or Continental. Um, because of the modern metallurgy that we use in the 9 series engines, which is very similar to automotive technology. Let me pause here for a moment and talk about the turning the propeller on the Rotax engine. If you're facing the propeller on this engine, as I am, it's always counterclockwise. What fuel can I burn in my Rotax engine? The best fuel in most cases is an unleaded automobile gas. If you're using conventional coolant and you happen to have a small leak or find that, you're, that you need to add some That's coolant on a trip, um, it's a lot easier to find conventional coolant or even to top off with a little bit of distilled water in a pinch to get you home. Evans, uh, if you're using Evans, you must completely purge the system. When we get these tech questions on the phone, uh, we're really acting like a doctor trying to figure out what's wrong with the patient. The patient tells us what the symptoms are and uh, we have to listen to that and, and sort through the symptoms and then try and figure out what the cause of the problem is. It's kind of interesting sometimes. It's, boy, and it's sometimes like, it's you, something totally unrelated to what they thought was going on. We certainly learn a lot uh, doing that uh, on the tech support line and, and, and Dean answering it as often as he does, he, he certainly stays on top of things. Um, we'd like to talk about some, some things that, that come up perhaps not questions on the tech support line, but perhaps problems, again, that could be avoided, uh, where we, we see the symptoms, we see the results, uh, but uh, the customer doesn't really know what to ask. They just right. tell us what's going wrong. And uh, one of them would be uh, burning up the stator. Now, when you're starting these engines in cold weather, if you want it to start properly, you're gonna use, you call it the choke, but really it's a, it's a starting circuit. And that introduces additional fuel straight from the float chamber up into the throat of the carburetor, it's not going to work unless the throttle's at idle. You've got to have the throttle all the way back at idle. That means that the butterfly, which actually throttles the engine, is all the way closed. It has to be all the way closed to create enough suction to draw that fuel. A lot of people will crack the throttle just a just little like bit. Just like you do on a light they coming or turn the choke, pull the choke on, and guess what? The choke doesn't work. Doesn't the engine work. won't start.
You've got two carburetors, which is part of why we get the performance out of this lightweight compact engine. Right. Um, I mean, even today, a lot of modern outboards uh, and motorcycles still use multiple carburetors. Exactly. You know? I mean, it really does allow you to get a lot of power. Um, but because we have two carburetors, they have to be synchronized. Now, once it's done properly, the operator, it's no problem. You know, if right. you have a good linkage, you're, you're set. But uh, it needs to be checked uh, when you have your 100-hour inspections, and it needs to be done initially. So most people are going to be idling in the 1600 to 1800 RPM. Let's start this engine up and show you how it sounds when it's idling a bit too low, and then how it sounds when it's idling at the proper speed. Given an engine that clatters in the manner that we just observed, you would want to check that installation for carburetor synchronization. To do so, you would use a kit such as this one. This kit is specially designed to use two vacuum gauges. The vacuum gauges are selected in a manner that they are reading identical at any given pressure. 